4. The historical results of the propagation of scripture doctrine. 1. The rapid progress of the gospel in the first centuries of our era shows its divine origin. A. That paganism should have been in three centuries supplanted by Christianity, is an acknowledged wonder of history. The con conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity was the most astonishing revolution of faith and worship ever known. 50 years after the death of Christ, there were churches in all the principal cities of the Roman Empire. Nero, 3768, found, as Tacitus declares, an ingens multitudo of Christians to persecute. Pliny writes to Trajan, 52117, that they pervaded not merely the cities but the villages and country places, so that the temples were nearly deserted. Tertullian, 160230, writes, We are but of yesterday, and yet we have filled all your places, your cities, your islands, your castles, your towns, your council houses, even your camps, your tribes, your senate, your forum. We have left you nothing but your temples. In the time of the Emperor Valerian, 253268, the Christians constituted half the population of Rome. The conversion of the Emperor Constantine, 272337, brought the whole empire, only 300 years after Jesus' death. Under the acknowledged sway of the Gospel. See MacIlvain and Alexander, Evidences of Christianity. B. The wonder is the greater when we consider the obstacles to the progress of Christianity. A. The skepticism of the cultivated classes, B. The prejudice and hatred of the common people, and C. The persecution set on foot by government. A. Missionaries even now find it difficult to get a hearing among the cultivated classes of the heathen. But the gospel appeared in the most enlightened age of antiquity, the Augustan age of literature and historical inquiry. Tacitus called the religion of Christ exitiabilis superstitio, quos per flagitia in visos vulgus Christianos appellabat. Pliny, Nile aeliad in vini quam superstition improvam et imodicam. If the gospel had been false, its preachers would not have ventured into the centers of civilization and refinement, or if they had, they would have been detected. b. Consider the interweaving of heathen religions with all the relations of life. Christians often had to meet the furious zeal and blind rage of the mob, as at Lystra and Ephesus. C. Rawlinson, in his Historical Evidences, claims that the catacombs of Rome comprised 900 miles of streets and 7 millions of graves within a period of 400 years, a far greater number than could have died a natural death, and that vast multitudes of these must have been massacred for their faith. The Encyclopaedia Britannica, however, calls the estimate of De Marchi, which Rawlinson appears to have taken as authority, a great exaggeration. Instead of 900 miles of streets, Northcote has 350. The number of interments to correspond would be less than 3 millions. The catacombs began to be deserted by the time of Jerome. The times when they were universally used by Christians could have been hardly more than 200 years. They did not begin in sandpits. There were three sorts of tufa, one, rocky, used for quarrying, and two hard for Christian purposes, two, sandy, used for sandpits, two soft to permit construction of galleries and tombs, three, granular, that used by Christians. The existence of the catacombs must have been well known to the heathen. After Pope Damasus the exaggerated reverence for them began. They were decorated and improved. Hence, Many paintings are of later date than 400, and testify to papal polity, not to that of early Christianity. The bottles contain, not blood, but wine of the Eucharist celebrated at the funeral. Fisher, Nature and Method of Revelation, 256258, calls attention to Matthew Arnold's description of the needs of the heathen world, yet his blindness to the true remedy. On that hard pagan world disgust and secret loathing fell, deep weariness and sated lust made human life a hell. In his cool hall, with haggard eyes, the Roman noble lay, he drove abroad, in furious guise, along the Appian Way, he made a feast, drank fierce and fast, and crowned his hair with flowers, no easier nor no quicker past the impracticable hours. Yet with mingled pride and sadness, Mr. Arnold fastidiously rejects more heavenly nutriment. Of Christ he says, now he is dead. Far hence he lies, in the lawn Syrian town, and on his grave, with shining eyes, 
the Syrian stars look down. He sees that the millions have such need of joy, and joy whose grounds are true, and joy that should all hearts employ as when the past was new. The want of the world is, one mighty wave of thought and joy, lifting mankind amain. But the poet sees no ground of hope, fools. That so often here, happiness mocked our prayer, I think might make us fear a like event elsewhere, make us not fly to dreams, but moderate desire. He sings of the time when Christianity was young, oh, had I lived in that great day, how had its glory new filled earth and heaven, and caught away my ravished spirit too. But desolation of spirit does not bring with it any lowering of self-esteem, much less the humility which deplores the presence and power of evil in the soul, and sighs for deliverance. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, Matt. 9.12, rejecting. Christ, Matthew Arnold embodies in his verse, the sweetness, the gravity, the strength, the beauty, and the languor of death, Hutton, Essays, 302. See, the wonder becomes yet greater when we consider the natural insufficiency of the means used to secure this progress. A. The proclaimers of the gospel were in general unlearned men, belonging to a despised nation. B. The gospel which they proclaimed was a gospel of salvation through faith in a Jew who had been put to an ignominious death. C. This gospel was one which excited natural repugnance, by humbling men's pride, striking at the root of their sins, and demanding a life of labor and self-sacrifice. D. The gospel, moreover, was an exclusive one, suffering no rival and declaring itself to be the universal and only religion. A. The early Christians were more unlikely to make converts than modern Jews are to make proselytes, in vast numbers, in the principal cities of Europe and America. Celsus called Christianity a religion of the rabble. B. The cross was the Roman gallows, the punishment of slaves. Cicero calls it servitutis extremum summum supplicium. C. There were many bad religions, why should the mild Roman Empire have persecuted the only good one? The answer is in part, persecution did not originate with the official classes, it proceeded really from the people at large. Tacitus called Christians haters of the human race. Men recognized in Christianity a foe to all their previous motives, ideals, and aims. Altruism would break up the old society, for every effort that centered in self or in the present life was stigmatized by the gospel as unworthy. D. Heathenism, being without creed or principle, did not care to propagate itself. A man must be very weak, said Celsus, to imagine that Greeks and barbarians, in Asia, Europe, and Libya, can ever unite under the same system of religion. So the Roman government would allow no religion which did not participate in the worship of the state. Keep yourselves from idols, we worship no other god, was the Christian's answer. Gibbon, his decline and fall, 1, chapter 15, mentions as secondary causes, 1, the zeal of the Jews, 2, the doctrine of immortality, 3, miraculous powers, 4, virtues of early Christians, 5, privilege of participation in church government. But, the, these causes were only secondary, and all would have been insufficient without an invincible persuasion of the truth of Christianity. For answer to Gibbon, see Peroni, Prolections Theologici, 1 133. Persecution destroys Fossard by leading its advocates to investigate the grounds of their belief, but it strengthens and multiplies truth by leading its advocates to see more clearly the foundations of their faith. There have been many conscientious persecutors, John 16 verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the hour cometh, that whosoever killeth you shall think that he offereth service unto God. The decretal of Pope Urban II reads, For we do not count them to be homicides, to whom it may have happened, through their burning zeal against the excommunicated, to put any of them to death. St. Louis, King of France, urged his officers not to argue with the infidel, but to subdue unbelievers by thrusting the sword into them as far as it will go. Of the use of the rack in England on a certain occasion, it was said that it was used with all the tenderness which the nature of the instrument would allow. This reminds us of Isaac. Walton's instruction as to the use of the frog, put the hook through his mouth and out at his gills, and, in so doing, use him as though you loved him. Robert Browning, in his Easter Day, 275288, gives us what purports to be a martyr's epitaph, 
inscribed upon a wall of the catacombs, which furnishes a valuable contrast to the skeptical and pessimistic strain of Matthew Arnold. I was born sickly, poor and mean, a slave, no misery could screen the holders of the pearl of price from Caesar's envy. Therefore twice I fought with beasts, and three times saw my children suffer by his. Law, at length my own release was earned, I was some time in being burned, but at the close a hand came through the fire above my head, and drew my soul to Christ, whom now I see. Sir Jews, a brother, writes for me this testimony on the wall, for me, I have forgot it all. The progress of a religion so unprepossessing and uncompromising to outward acceptance and dominion, within the space of three hundred years, cannot be explained without supposing that divine power attended its promulgation, and therefore that the gospel is a revelation from God. Stanley, Life and Letters, 1 527, in the Kremlin Cathedral, whenever the Metropolitan advanced from the altar to give his blessing, there was always thrown under his feet a carpet embroidered with the eagle of old pagan Rome to indicate that the Christian church and empire of Constantinople had succeeded and triumphed over it. On this whole section, C.F. W. Farrell, Witness of History to Christ, 91, MacIlvain, Wisdom of Holy Scripture, 139. 2. The beneficent influence of the Scripture doctrines and precepts, wherever they have had sway, shows their divine origin. Notice a. Their influence on civilization in general, securing a recognition of principles which heathenism ignored, such as Garbutt mentions, a. The importance of the individual, b. The law of mutual love, c. The sacredness of human life, d. The doctrine of internal holiness, e. The sanctity of home, f. Monogamy, and the religious equality of the sexes, g. Identification of belief and practice. The continued corruption of heathen lands shows that this change is not due to any laws of merely natural progress. The confessions of ancient writers show that it is not due to philosophy. Its only explanation is that the gospel is the power of God. Garbutt, Dogmatic Faith, 177186, F.W., For All, Witness of History to Christ, Chapter on Christianity and the Individual, Brace, Gesta Christi, Preface, 6, Practices and Principles Implanted stimulated or supported by Christianity, such as regard for the personality of the weakest and poorest, respect for woman, duty of each member of the fortunate classes to raise up the unfortunate, humanity to the child, the prisoner, the stranger, the needy, and even to the brute, unceasing. Opposition to all forms of cruelty, oppression and slavery, the duty of personal purity, and the sacredness of marriage, the necessity of temperance, obligation of a more equitable division of the profits of labor, and of greater cooperation between employers and employed, the right of every human being to have the utmost opportunity of developing his faculties, and of all persons to enjoy equal political and social privileges, the principle that the injury of one nation is the injury of all, and the expediency and duty of unrestricted trade and intercourse between all countries, and finally, a profound opposition to war, a determination to limit its evils when existing and to prevent its arising by means of international arbitration. Max Muller, the concept of humanity is the gift of Christ. Gizet, History of Civilization, 1, Introd, tells us that in ancient times the individual existed for the sake of the state, in modern times the state exists for the sake of the individual. The individual is a discovery of Christ. On the relations between Christianity and political economy, C. A. H. Strong, Philosophy and Religion, Pages 443460, on the cause of the changed view with regard to the relation of the individual to the state, see page 207, what has wrought the change? Nothing but the death of the Son of God. When it was seen that the smallest child and the lowest slave had a soul of such worth that Christ left his throne and gave up his life to save it, the world's estimate of values changed, and modern history began. Lucian, the Greek satirist and humorist, 160 AD, said of the Christians, their first legislator, Jesus, has put it into their heads that they are all brothers. It is this spirit of common brotherhood which has led in most countries to the abolition of cannibalism, infanticide, widow burning, and slavery. Prince Bismarck, for social well-being I ask nothing more than Christianity without phrases, which means the religion of the deed rather than of the creed. Yet it is only faith in the historic revelation of God in Christ which has made Christian deeds possible. Shaler, Interpretation of Nature, 232278, Aristotle, if he could look over society today, would think modern man a new species, in his going out in sympathy to distant peoples. 
This cannot be the result of natural selection, for self-sacrifice is not profitable to the individual. Altruistic emotions owe their existence to God. Worship of God has flowed back upon man's emotions and has made them more sympathetic. Self-consciousness and sympathy, coming into conflict with brute emotions, originate the sense of sin. Then begins the war of the natural and the spiritual. Love of nature and absorption in others is the true nirvana. Not physical science, but the humanities, are most needed in education. H. E. Hersey, Introd. To Browning's Christmas Eve, 19, Sidney Lanny tells us that the last 20 centuries have spent their best power upon the development of personality. Literature, education, government, and religion have learned to recognize the individual as the unit of force. Browning goes a step further. He declares that so powerful is a complete personality that its very touch gives life and courage and potency. He turns to history for the inspiration of enduring virtue and the stimulus for sustained effort, and he finds both in Jesus Christ. J. P. Cook, Credentials of Science, 43. The change from the ancient philosopher to the modern investigator is the change from self-assertion to self-devotion, and the great revolution can be traced to the influence of Christianity, and to the spirit of humility exhibited and inculcated by Christ. Lewis, Hist. Philos, 1408, Greek morality never embraced any conception of humanity, no Greek ever attained to the sublimity of such a point of view. Kid, Social Evolution, 165, 287. It is not intellect that has pushed forward the world of modern times. It is the altruistic feeling that originated in the cross and sacrifice of Christ. The French Revolution was made possible by the fact that humanitarian ideas had undermined the upper classes themselves. An effective resistance was impossible. Socialism would abolish the struggle for existence on the part of individuals. What security would be left for social progress? Removing all restrictions upon population ensures progressive deterioration. A non-socialist community would outstrip a socialist community where all the main wants of life were secure. The real tendency of society is to bring all the people into rivalry, not only on a footing of political equality, but on conditions of equal social opportunities. The state in future will interfere and control in order to preserve or secure free competition, rather than to suspend it. The goal is not socialism or state management, but competition in which all shall have equal advantages. The evolution of human society is not primarily intellectual but religious. The winning races are the religious races. The Greeks had more intellect. But we have more civilization and progress. The Athenians were as far above us as we are above the Negro race. Gladstone said that we are intellectually weaker than the men of the Middle Ages. When the intellectual development of any section of the race has for the time being outrun its ethical development, natural selection has apparently weeded it out, like any other unsuitable product. Evolution is developing reverence, with its allied qualities, mental energy, resolution, enterprise, prolonged and concentrated application, simple-minded and single-minded devotion to duty. Only religion can overpower selfishness and individualism and ensure social progress. b. Their influence upon individual character and happiness, wherever they have been tested in practice. This influence is seen, a. In the moral transformations they have wrought, as in the case of Paul the Apostle, and of persons in every Christian community, b, in the self-denying labors for human welfare to which they have led, as in the case of Wilberforce and Judson, c, in the hopes they have inspired in times of sorrow and death. These beneficent fruits cannot have their source in merely natural causes, apart from the truth and divinity of the scriptures, for in that case the contrary beliefs would be accompanied by the same blessings. But since we find these blessings only in connection with Christian teaching, we may justly consider this as their cause. This teaching, then, must be true, and the scriptures must be a divine revelation. Else God has made a lie to be the greatest blessing to the race. The first Moravian missionaries to the West Indies walked 600 miles to take ship, work their passage, and then sold themselves as slaves, in order to get the privilege of preaching to the Negroes. The father of John G. Patton was a stocking weaver. The whole family, with the exception of the very small children, worked from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. With one hour for dinner at noon and a half hour each for breakfast and supper. Yet family prayer was regularly held twice a day. 
In these breathing spells for daily meals John G. Patton took part of his time to study the Latin grammar, that he might prepare himself for missionary work. When told by an uncle that, if he went to the New Hebrides, the cannibals would eat him, he replied, you yourself will soon be dead and buried, and I had as leaf be eaten by cannibals as by worms. The Anichumis raised arrowroot for 15 years, and sold it to pay the £1,200 required for printing the Bible in their own language. Universal church attendance and Bible study make those South Sea Islands the most heavenly place on earth on the Sabbath day. In 1839, 20,000 Negroes in Jamaica gathered to begin a life of freedom. Into a coffin were put the handcuffs and shackles of slavery, relics of the whipping post and the scourge. As the clock struck twelve at night, a preacher cried with the first stroke, the monster is dying, and so with every stroke until the last, when he cried, the monster is dead. Then all rose from their knees and sang, praise God from whom all blessings flow. What do you do that for? said the sick Chinaman whom the medical missionary was tucking up in bed with a care which the patient had never received since he was a baby. The missionary took the opportunity to tell him of the love of Christ. The aged Australian mother, when told that her two daughters, missionaries in China, had both of them been murdered by a heathen mob, only replied, this decides me, I will go to China now myself, and try to teach those poor creatures what the love of Jesus means. Dr. William Ashmore, let one missionary die, and ten come to his funeral. A shoemaker, teaching neglected boys and girls while he worked at his cobbler's bench, gave the impulse to Thomas Guthrie's life of faith. We must judge religions not by their ideals, but by their performances. Omar Khayyam and Mozumdar give us beautiful thoughts, but the former is not Persia, nor is the latter India. When the microscopic search of skepticism, which has hunted the heavens and sounded the seas to disprove the existence of a creator, has turned its attention to human society and has found on this planet a place ten miles square where a decent man can live in decency, comfort, and security, supporting and educating his children, unspoiled and unpolluted, a place where age is reverenced, infancy protected, manhood respected, womanhood honored, and human life held in due regard, when skeptics can find such a place ten miles square on this globe, where the gospel of Christ has not gone and cleared the way and laid the foundations and made decency and security possible, it will then be in order for the skeptical literati to move thither and to ventilate their views. But so long as these very men are dependent upon the very religion they discard for every privilege they enjoy, they may well hesitate before they rob the Christian of his hope and humanity of its faith. In that Saviour who alone has given that hope of eternal life which makes life tolerable and society possible, and robs death of its terrors and the grave of its gloom. On the beneficent influence of the Gospel, C. Schmidt, Social Results of Early Christianity, D. J. Hill, The Social Influence of Christianity.